than any combination of 10 leaders in the history of this country. And black people never stuttered once in their support of Dr. Jefferson. That's why he won in court. That's why we had a judge who took the position he took. That's why Joe Fleming had the spirit he had, because black people did not stumble on this question. Black politicians, thank God, except for our not so illustrious mayor, sometimes, <laughs> did not speak out against him. One little brother in the Bronx, but he cleared his throat a week later. Officials of the NACP would not speak out against it. The usual parrots and parasites did not speak out against it. For once they were faced with black people facing the responsibility of identifying our enemy and not backing up. It's easy to accept the fantasy of having friends that are not really friends. We've done it for too long, and the death toll is too high to continue. We've done it for too long, and the unemployment line is too long to continue. We've done it for too long, and the construction jobs in our communities of the wrong complexion to complete to continue. We've done it too long, and the approval of mortgages in our community is too small to continue. We know, and we want you to know, that Dr. Jeffries is not an aberration. What you just saw and what he did two years ago is not an accident of history. He did not make a speech accidentally that people got upset over. He made a very calculated, very deliberate speech in response to our enemy's attack on our people. Dr. Jeffries is not alone. There are other scholars who were meeting with him nationally, and the question raised in New York around the curriculum of inclusion was being raised by a collective that met in Chicago, in Detroit, in Cincinnati, in Oakland, in San Francisco, and Miami and Fort Lauderdale and Atlanta and South Carolina. And they thought that they had the juggler thing. They decided that if we can hit this one up in New York and bring him down, we will bring the national movement around curricula of inclusion and infusion down. They picked the wrong target this time. <laughs> The wrong While we've been sitting in Chicago tri-monthly over a few years trying to plan out the strategies of where we would move, we were unaware that the federal government under Bennett initially with Reagan and then Bush had advanced before Congress a bill that included a national curriculum, a bill that included national standardized testing so that we were initiating our local battles from the Portland-based essay to Asa Hilliard's infusion in Georgia to Barbara Sizemore's work in Pittsburgh to the brothers trying to build the Mail Academy in Detroit to Jay Carruthers and the Black United Front in Chicago they thought we had peaked their game and was countering that game, we were simply trying to help our people. So they attacked. Diane Ravitz and Arthur Schlesinger work out of the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. The Heritage Foundation, with a few other right-wing CIA-aligned think tanks, were behind the initial attack on Dr. Jeffrey. And of course, they were backed by the traditional thug and ally, the former tax collector in Europe, the former insurance carriers for the slave trade, and et cetera, our friends. And since they had 
created a style of making African peoples in America submit by accusing you of being anti, anti, a term and cliche that no one can define in relationship to any group of humans in terms of a racial designation. They thought by being able, and they've done a good job in seeding the press across the country with their cadres, and one must give them credit. They're well organized and well intended on surviving. But what they did not measure was your propensity to say you had had enough. And the greatest thing that I've seen, and because they're not talking about it, don't think they haven't seen it, is your ability to stand fast. Do you realize that you did not bow nor stumble through this whole thing in support of Dr. Jefferson? Do you realize that there's been a black united front stronger than what my commander Malcolm enjoyed? Or our Prince Martin enjoyed? I have never seen black folks take a stand nationally and internationally in defense of their rights and advancing their integrity to speak the truth from their perspective about things that affected them. I have never seen this stance before, and I don't think anybody else has. And what it has allowed to happen is other people who were frightened of the big bad wolf is now coming forward and telling their truth. I don't think the FBI would have raided the ADL office had Leonard Jeffries not taken his sentence. I don't think the book would have come forward talking about Spindard, one of the founders of the NACP and his first president for most of his history, was an intelligence agent spying on the NACP at the time he was supposed to be our friend. See, one action can cause other actions to take place. We wondered why there was a rift between Dr. Washington and Dr. Du Bois, and Dr. Du Bois and the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Now we know where to look for the answer to find the agitator behind the scene that has caused us all of that pain. You know, it is odd, but we have to relook Booker Washington. I don't I always have an affinity for Booker Washington because I'm from South Carolina, Gucci boy. We leaning on old Booker down there, you know? But now we've got to research what happened to Booker Washington. Because Booker Washington was no little man. Booker Washington was the most powerful man in this country and left us one of the most significant educational institutions in this country. Without Booker, we don't have a George Washington Carver. Without Booker, who invited Marcus Garvey to come to black America, we may not have enjoyed the great organizational skills and teaching of the Honorable Messiah Marcus Garvey. We may have to research Booker again and understand that he got deathly sick after coming to New York City to call a peace meeting between him and the boys and others at a downtown hotel to patch up the differences in the black movement and trying to put the new rising intellectualism represented by the boys in an alliance with the technocrats that were being developed at Tuskegee. And he never left New York well, and he died shortly thereafter. We now have to do research and see if Mr. Booker was poisoned and indeed murdered by some of our friends. It's serious business. You think they're jumping on Lenny because of a couple of phrases that he used? You gotta understand the seriousness of this thing. 
We blow every year nearly $400 billion, not with ourselves, with whom are we spending our money? You get your mind straight and spend your money with yourself, somebody's going to be out of hundreds of billions of dollars. Do you understand? <laughs> Dr. Du Bois is praised now. And the NACP have functions honoring him. But they treated him in the most disgusting, abusive, disrespectful way and then kicked him out after using him to found an organization that was used to put civil rights legislation on the book that benefits Jews more than it benefited us. Back up. When was the ADL found? When was Betty Brick raised in America? The same year as the NACP. What happened a year before that? We had Red Summer with all the lynchings of our folks here. We had the burning of a whole town in the Midwest of black people and the murder of thousands of black people. But something else happened that frightened our friends. One man named Frank was lynched. A white Jewish American lynch for raping a white Anglo-Saxon child in Georgia in preference to a black suspect who was involved with him. You think that didn't frighten them? I'm just trying to tell you to understand where all this is coming from. If you read a book called Broken Alliance, Turbulent Times Between Blacks and Jews, by a cat named Jonathan Kaufman, who writes for the Boston Globe. You will see at the time of the founding of the NACP and during the very time of the lynching of Frank in Georgia and during the time of Red Summer in America, our friends were being driven out of towns in Poland and Russia and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia and burned and murdered in the streets. And they knew there was no safe sanctuary for them in Europe and America was their last best hope but they knew they dare not anger the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant by advocating that they get the enfranchisement in the South because they were more disenfranchised in the South than we were. They had gotten a foothold in the Northeast and had created an overeducated population that they had to disperse out and abundance of capital they had to invest and needed places to do it and we became the Karen Father to help put on the books the laws, rules, and regulations that would ensure their civil rights. And then got us on a guilt trip as though they were benefactors. That's what some of this is about. <laughs> Pulling the cover off of the not so truth. Anytime any of our leaders got close all of the red flags went up, anti, 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 using everything possible to break them down, no matter how legitimate the question was. But an examination of our history will show us things that will frighten us. All Dr. Jeffries did was to expose a little history, advance the living truth to his people. Just to say, it's wake up time. It's time to get ready. <laughs> Almost that time. We lose more young black people in America each year than is lost in South Africa in any 10 year period, and we don't miss them because they've already defined your children as criminals and the threat is legal to kill them. We know our infant mortality rate matches any third world country, yet they have us walking about enjoying life like nothing's going on. It amazed me the other day, I was up in Rochester speaking up there for the black social workers and so I went to my hotel room and watched a little TV and watched the news and when I go around the country, I like to watch the news, and New York is the only place you can't get news on the news. 
And it didn't, it really hit me up in Rochester yesterday because I said, my God, these people have news here. They talk about things happening in the communities where people live. We have soap opera masquerading as news. Whatever this little criminal with the body shop and the little whore who shot his wife. We had to spend money listening to this video. Now they've got some nuts bed hopping with another man and helping to kill his wife and calling them by some silly little name, whatever, up in Westchester County, and they've got us in that thing. We don't need to be in that with them. <laughs> A long time ago, when I was younger, I'm still younger, but when I was younger, we used to hear about Big Brother and Mind Control. And they put out a lot of fancy books about all the machine and gadgetry that would be used. We used to think in terms of people wearing stormtrooper boots like the Gestapo of Nazi Germany coming into our homes. And when those symbols never appeared, we assumed that Big Brother never came into being. But I dare to tell you to examine yourself if you want to see the extent to which they are in control of you and me. Look in the historical mirror for your African model. Spiritually, psychologically, culturally, and see if you resemble your model. And if you do not resemble your African historical model, spiritually, psychologically, philosophically, and culturally, then you have to ask yourself, what do you resemble and why? The notion of changing curriculum and the idea of spreading study groups and setting up lecture series like these young brothers have done is a way to change the image in the historical mirror for African peoples. They know what time it is. If you don't think they believe in that methodology, wonder why there's so many institutions of learning and religion of theirs that they attend so frequently and with such zeal. It is all about identifying yourself in nature consistent with the experiences that your ancestral history dictates as yours. Because if you are confused about identity, you've lost the whole ball game. Anybody, anybody that is confused about identity they call them psychologically disoriented, and they have a place to put you. Right? If you walk into an office and says, oh, I don't know whether I'm a man or a woman, and I don't know my name, and I don't know where I came from, and I don't know where I live, you will be committed to a psychiatric ward. Serious business. And they won't wait for no family to sign you in there. Now you think of yourself as you look in the ancestral mirror, whether those questions will fit you or me. Then you begin to understand the seriousness of the war that you have engaged because in standing up to this question, you says, I have decided to realize I'm in war and to fight according to someone who is in war. See, they fooled us quite a bit in the 60s. When we rose up, they told us there was only certain ways to fight. They told us there's only certain ways to organize. They told us there's only certain ideological perspectives that can be used. And they presented to us in books already on the shelves 
They presented us with symbols and decals and but well, we didn't know that the ideologies that our friends were so graciously teaching us and the books that were so available and the terminologies and the cliches we were using, they were well prepared for. If I've got to fight you, let me teach you how to fight me so I can win. And they did that very well. All the young heroes who died, they were not unsincere. I'm not trying to defame any of them. They were sincere and they died for us. They died that we might live a free life. But they were manipulated and misused by people who called them revolutionary comrades. So that they could skim the cream of the aware revolutionary potential and destroy them before they can do anything significant for your liberation. I'm making that charge, because it's real. So, we be about something different now. We be about using the knowledge of history to set up an African philosophical perspective or an African ideological foundation from which to launch our struggles. They understand that they understand that you cannot fight anybody unless the ideology you're using comes out of your experience of oppression. You may borrow concepts and ideas from others, but whenever the concepts and ideas you use to free yourself belong to others, you are in much old trouble. Could you imagine a tiger going up against a lion using the fighting methodology of a snake, the tiger's going to be killed. Or if you could imagine, let's change it up, that the tiger will go to the lion or to the lion's brother saying, instruct me in a methodology, my friend, that will help me beat your brother. But we've made those errors. But this time we decided that it is not just sufficient to use the term African to define ourselves. That through changing curriculas and setting up study groups and holding lectures and doing preachings and teachings about our history and looking at the philosophy of our ancestors and reading the literature of our ancestors and studying the religions of our ancestors, we are going to develop a method of reconstructing ourselves that's going to allow us to survive and be victorious. We're going to lead a struggle that we are leading and not be involved in a struggle that our enemies lead. So Dr. Jeffries, with his comrades, brothers and sisters, have been working to advance this notion that through knowledge of history and a knowledge of your history and traditions, you can develop the necessary institutions for your liberation. Our enemy understood this and say, let's destroy this messenger before somebody listens seriously to the message. What they didn't realize was that you had been listening to the message for a long time. They're finally getting in on the gossip and realizing something is being articulated that was a little different from what was approved in the big house. So, this thing in the courts is the worst whipping that white folks have ever had to enjoy <laughs> or not enjoy since the last good whipping Queen and Zinga gave them on the Angolan coast. <laughs> See, there's some beautiful things to learn and understand. 
They made us think that somehow in 1492 they just walked into Africa, kicked butt, and took us. But when you study history, you realize even though we didn't have the guns and the cannons, we kept them on the beaches of Africa for 400 years. Do y'all realize that? That they could not penetrate past the beach for 400 years. They were able to run in with raids and capture people. They were able to seize shorelines where they could be safe in their forts, which gave them access to their incoming ship. But they could not sustain any land base of any significance for 400 years. And because we had treachery within our own ranks and treachery from our Arab brothers from the north, we had a problem that they were able to take advantage of. But the fact that our people's propensity to struggle was so great that for 400 years with inferior weapon systems, we kept them on the beach should tell us something significant about the fighting spirit of African people. They did not enjoy any significant on-the-ground victory that could be sustained until the invention of the Gatling gun, which gave them an enormous technical advantage, best demonstrated with the death of General Bombata, General of the Zulu Nation, who lost thousands of men in a one-day battle when they came up against that gun. The Zulu had gotten so proficient and so scientific in fighting the European <laughs> that they could calculate the amount of time it took to load a cannon and fire and could train their soldiers to move from the point of the last encounter within range where the cannon was a negative weapon and launch their assaults without suffering any major damage. But unfortunately, when that Gatlin gun was introduced, we were outmaneuvered technologically in terms of military technology. But even that didn't give them any sustainable land victory. And he said, well, how did Brother Small get way here? Because we always here. Before that day, I'm going to seize you with a little spiritual understanding on who and where you are right now. But what we need when we study our history, we will learn some key things like what I just said about the fighting spirit. It is important to be able to translate that to yourself, your children, and your community. They did not sustain any significant victory in Africa holding land until when? After the Berlin Conference, when all of the European nations combined launched the military assault on Africa at one time and overwhelmed us with their military technology. And even then, they sustained losses they don't care to write about. <laughs> the war was bigger than both the First and the Second World War, and they don't even call it a war. But if we look at our history, we must declare to ourselves that one of the greatest wars in history was fought between us and the armies of Europe after the Berlin Conference, where every single army of every single European nation invaded Africa at one time, from the north, east, south, and west. But also when we study that history, we will find examples and models in history to emulate and to tell our children about and men like Abdullah of the Sudan and Chippy too of Zaire and Amanatu of Nigeria and so on. And we will realize that it was not a walk in the park coming into our motherland. And we will be able to ask the questions of our history and of our culture that will tell us how they managed to sustain for so long against such brutal military technology. And we will learn how to reorganize ourselves the way they were reorganized or organized. 
because the bottom line of studying history and having curricular change has to do with the organization of the family as the foundation for community. And within that construct, the organization of the person, what people are afraid of in terms of what Len Jeffries has been trying to advance, talking about Egypt, talking about the, 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 the stuck people, ice people, talking about the North and South, talking about communal collective cooperative versus the devastating devilishness that came from the North, what they're afraid of is somehow you will realize through examining Africa and African peoples, even in the Caribbean and the Americas where they brought their system, that there is a way to organize and survive in Brooklyn against the Jewish mafia, the Italian mafia, the Russian mafia, the Polish mafia, the Colombian mafia. Realizing now we are the only community that do not have an organized crime network as the primary foundation of our community. <laughs> Understand that. Real clear. I'm going to say that again because see, we are caught up in a joke saying, well, let's look at them. They're a good example. Look how they made it. Stop fooling yourself. They made it because they operate from a criminal base apparatus. Anytime you try to compete with them on a level field, you end up in the trash can in the alley with your head gone. Because you didn't understand the rules of the game, nor did you understand the game you were in. And the education they have advanced to you is to misguide you about the game and the rules so that you think you're playing, but they'll always be winning. Examine their history. They've written all the books about themselves. Dr. J shows you, and he'll show you tonight. They've written all these books. They're so arrogant and proud of their devilishness that they write about it. That's why they didn't want us to learn to read during slavery time. <laughs> African word for knowledge is voodoo aha and voodoo da. But they done made you scared of the word voodoo. <laughs> Somebody drop voodoo on y'all and y'all want to do it. <laughs> <What? laughs> but one of the most sacred words in the African language, voodoo da, coming out of the every town means the greatest knowledge, which is God. The greatest knowledge is what they call God. Voodoo Aha is the man or woman who realize themselves in relationship to that great knowledge. And the only knowledge that can be great for you as an organism, both biologically and psycho-spiritual, is the knowledge of yourself. Elijah tried to tell you that, but you missed it. And if it was so unimportant, why do we have American history, Western civilization, Greek history? We've got to learn that stuff. Go to any synagogue and see if they're teaching about African Americans. When you go into the Catholic Church, my God, Dr. Jeffries is ready in five minutes. Don't y'all feel good about that? <laughs> I hope he's proud that he's going to develop the whole audience for him and get him warmed up. But I'm going to tell you something. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. 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 Let's go to strong and healthy Africans. Using knowledge to find a model to reconstruct ourselves personally and our families and thus our communities and our nation. 
When we study our history, we realize immediately we have never had the opportunity to construct nuclear families off. Nuclear families have not fallen apart. We never had them. Right. What has been attacked and devastated and damaged have been the extended communal family that we came here with and sustained through slavery and still have for the most part. But because we keep misdiagnosing the problem and recognizing or looking at the wrong model to repair ourselves, we keep coming up with this damaged product. Imagine you driving a Mercedes and something goes wrong and the mechanics say, well, bring me the blueprint. And somebody bring him a Chevrolet blueprint, blueprint to repair the Mercedes. He may, in some sense, do something that appears to be a repair, but it will not be the restoration of the Mercedes. And as soon as you hit some bump, the damage will reoccur. So as I walk away from this mic and let this brother of y'all come to see, come home, think of it in this term. And our ancient ancestors who did painted white in the bottom had a phraseology that they referenced. And I like to look at Dr. Jeffries in this way now. We've been friends for 20 something years and working together for that long. I think of him as the ancestors say, he who falls upon this stone will be broken. He upon whom this stone falls as the court demonstrates, will be crushed. <laughs> the stone that the builders of the society, and what I mean by the stone that this builders of the society, meaning the stone that represents your cultural, philosophical truth, have been rejected. And in rejecting that stone, the stone self-realizing through self-knowledge, will become again for the world the head of the corner. That means in charge of everything. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor James Small, ladies and gentlemen. Right, I'll be warmed up. I'm gonna bring out my co-host, Tariq P. Alexander. Hotel sisters and brothers. I know you've been waiting a long time, Dr. J, but he's here. Uh, did everyone enjoy the band? Let's give it up. Uh, what I'd like to do at this time is inform you of the uh, Guardian's um, Cultural Awareness Lecture Number 5. For those of you who haven't received the flyer, I ask that you do so prior to leaving. The tickets will also be sold here tonight. The reason for this being is the limited space. Um, the Cultural Awareness Lecture Number 5 will consist of the African Holocaust along the coast of Africa from the slave from Gori Island to Armenian dungeon, slave dungeons in Ghana. This tape is a premiere showing by Transatlantic uh, Minister Clemson Brown. Is he here? Yeah. Somewhere around here. Well, this is a premiere showing. This is never shown before in, to the public. Uh, I urge you to purchase your tickets and come um, view this filming. It will give you clarity on who we are today, why we think the way we think today as a people. Um, and I, I urge, like I said, that you do attend. It'll be Friday, June 11th, 1993 at 7 p.m. at IS 258, which is located at 141 Macon Street in Brooklyn, New York, between Marcy Avenue and Tompkins Avenue. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna call a few names, the, the members of the Cultural Awareness Committee. Um, these events may look like they're kinda easy, but uh, in actuality, they're very hard to put together. And we have so very few trying to do so much. So when I call your names, I ask that 
you please stand and remain standing. And I'll, the audience, would you please acknowledge them? Brother Vernon Wells. <laughs> Patricia Stevens. <laughs> Sister Lorraine Perelli. <laughs> Brother Dario Sims. Brother Terrence Wainsley, and Brother Noah Leader. These ladies and gentlemen are the Cultural Awareness Committee, people that, have, that have, been, have been bringing you these functions. Uh, for those of you who may have missed our first two Cultural Awareness Lectures, which were the scholars, the masters, I told you, right? <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we waited long enough. Please stand and welcome Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Hotel brothers and sisters, it is indeed a pleasure to see all of you here in Brooklyn at Boys and Girls High, and we want to thank the Guardians for bringing us together, and this is in, I guess, the fifth of a series, so you need to keep coming out, as they are exposing you to our great scholars and some of my mentors, Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, and some of my partners. As you heard, my extension of my right arm, Professor James Small. Can we give Professor James Small an acknowledgement round of applause? As all of you know, there's been a lot of publicity in reference to Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Jr. I wish I had a dime for every time my name is used on the radio, TV, and in the newspapers. But I guess I don't have to worry about those little bits of dimes here and there because there should be some big bucks coming down the pipe. <laughs> but it's important for all of you to know that the issues that we raised were raised out of principle, violation of our fundamental human rights, not American constitutional rights. We raised these issues because no one has a right to close down the African mind, and that's what these groups arrayed against us are asking you to do, to close down your African mind, and no one has the right to do that. So we brought the legal process, and we don't, it doesn't make any difference whether we get a nickel or a dime. But we had to win this fight because we could not afford to lose it. And we've won it, no matter what the other decisions are down the pipe. But you need to know that the struggle continues, and they're going to appeal and try to do everything to destroy any victory that we have. They're still going to create me, a demon in the media. You have to understand that. So our message is not to them who want to believe that. Let them believe that which they will. The message is to you. The message is to our young. The message is to Africans in the Caribbean, in Latin America and Brazil. The message is to Africans on the continent of Africa. The message is to Africans in England and other parts of Europe. We're dealing with the billion Africans on planet Earth and the two to three billion cousins of Africans in Asia and the islands of the Pacific. If the others wish to create us as demons, then that is their constitutional right, their right of freedom of speech and freedom of expression and freedom of the press. But don't you believe for one minute 
that which you see and read in the press. Because we are driven not by hate of any groups. We are not driven by vindictiveness and vengefulness. We're driven by the spirit of the almighty God of the universe. We're driven by the force and power of our ancestors. That which speaks to our heart is not Hitler and Ku Klux Klan demons, but that which speaks to our heart is the spirit of Malcolm X, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, the spirit of Marcus Garvey, the spirit of Patrick Tubman, the spirit of David Walker, the spirit of Frederick Douglass, the spirit of Nana Sewa, the spirit of Queen Nzinga, the spirit of Kwame Nkrumah. That's what speaks to us. And you need to understand that. So I'm glad to see all of you here so we can commune and we can lay down some serious information and data so you know really why they are attacking us. It has nothing to do with statements about the Jewish community, nothing to do with statements about the Italian community. It has to do with this awful African truth, which is hard for the world to digest. And we, more than anybody else, know how difficult it is to accept the truth about African peoples because we have been chased away from Africa in a systematic fashion. But in order for us to be true to ourselves and true to the spirit of our ancestors and the God Almighty that created us African, we have to move headlong into Africanness. That means you've got to form study groups, you've got to form research teams, you have to put this knowledge in your homes, and then you have to walk it into the schools. It needs to be in your churches. So there's a whole responsibility we have that this whole area opens up. But there will be people who will try to cloud your mind and try to move you away from your truth. Have you focusing on their circumstance and their situation. Having you define things through their eyes and their values. Having you only see their interests as if you have no interests. So this whole thing has monumental importance in terms of critical thinking Africans. Many people have come up to me and said, Dr. J will help you spend the money. Uh. <laughs> we first and foremost want to tell our family that the jury awarded $400,000. $400,000 has not been given to us. The university and the Attorney General's office has said that they will appeal. That means everything is on hold and everything is a question mark. A higher court may reduce the award. A higher court may reduce the award because it is rare and historic for awards to be given for the violation of speech. That's how important this decision has been. But by appealing, the state intends to drag me and you through the legal process for the next year or so, hoping that we will get tired, lose our concentration, and not have the resources to sustain our struggle. It will cost another $150,000 in the next six weeks to fight their appeal. So I do not have an award. I have a jury awarding us $400,000. But what I do have is the responsibility of generating $150,000 to fight this appeal. Just the transcripts alone cost thousands of dollars. The transcripts of the court. On appeal, that means we have to have all of the transcripts. We were in court for almost a month. You're talking about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars just for the court transcript. So let's be realistic, Africans. 
we still got a lot to do to show that we can take care of our own business. And I have to ask you to help me. And across this nation, Africans to help. And in other parts of the world, Africans to help. Because we can't do it by ourselves. And we're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for us. But they expect us to not to be able to shift our resources and fight this good legal fight, but continue to spend the money on their malt liquor, on their whiskey, to continue to spend the money on their perfume, to continue to spend the money on their hairspray, to continue to spend the money on their clothes, to continue to spend the money on their jewelry. So we're asking our people that this is a principal stand for African human rights, not just constitutional rights. And we've got to raise that money. So when you hear us saying Africans respond and make that sacrifice, we want you to know that we're making it first and foremost. Our lives are on the line. We're spending all of our savings for this fight. So we need your help. But we're on a victorious path. And so we've got to walk with dignity and glory in this victory. No one could have predicted when they began to attack, and the attack did not start in 91 with the Albany speech, it started in 88, it started in 89, when the curriculum of inclusion was the issue at hand. They became hysterical in 91, when we won the fight over the curriculum change. And then they created this hysteria by pushing the anti-Semitic button to cloud the victory that had been won on the curriculum fight. And then they created such hysteria that the people changing the curriculum now are afraid to make the changes in the curriculum. That was the reason for the hysteria. It had nothing to do with words said about Jews, or words said about Italians, or words said about Hollywood. There's a larger political issue, changing the curriculum, which will change your minds. And that's what we've got to do. So we don't want you to go away saying, well, I came to Brooklyn thinking maybe Dr. J could share a little bit of that dough we got because, you know, we're going to build an addition onto the church and we're going to try to put a, a nursing home together and we got this other thing. We're going to go down to Jamaica and do something with the, our family home. There will be monies generated, but they will not be coming from court awards. We create the monies we need. The Negro in America, if he could just become African and use the 300 billion to 400 billion that he produces out of his mind and off of his back, out of his genius, if we could just use the wealth that we produce, 300 to 400 billion, and keep that in our community and use that for our world community, we would be able to transform ourselves. So let's get serious, Africans. Let's get serious. I know it's hard, because some of you don't even want to be African. I'm not African. I'm from Trinidad. I'm not African. I'm from Aruba. I'm not African. I'm from Jamaica, South Jamaica, out here in Queens. It is our Africanness that is our empowerment. Knowledge is power, and knowledge of your Africanness is your empowering force. And because people wanted to crip you and strip you of your power, they moved you systematically and unrelentlessly away from Africanness. And that's why Hollywood was created in terms of the negativity of African peoples. And that's why we were taken out of the history books, even though we began history and we are history. It was taken from us. So make no bones about it, the struggle continues and it will continue. Even after our deaths, the struggle continues. We stand in this enormous tradition of struggle, which if you knew about it, would empower you so you wouldn't walk through life with your head down. You wouldn't walk through life without a motivation. You wouldn't walk through life knowing that if Africans can conceive, and what Africans can conceive, they can achieve. But you've got to know this. 
but instead we're nurtured in a culture that says there's a rightness of whiteness. And as youngsters, we used to grow up and play a little ditty with each other. If you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. And if you're black, stay way back. And we can laugh at that, but that has been institutionalized as part of the culture of the world. It's institutionalized in the Caribbean. It's institutionalized in Brazil. It's institutionalized in America. It's institutionalized in England and other parts of the world where we have our people. We've got to destroy that and see all of us, no matter how light and how bright, no matter how brown and no matter how black, we are Africans. 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 So you know, I do nothing without acknowledging my Africanness. And in fact, I've said to all of you over and over again, I've been saying it for years, we would not be here if it wasn't for the power of the Almighty and the African Holy Ghost that we stand on in and around. And if you do not operate spiritually, you cannot achieve. Material achievement is not enough and is insignificant. It is the spiritual achievement that moves you to higher ground. And that court case that we have been involved in, wonderfully, marvelously, spectacularly, it is on sacred African holy ground. Those courts in Foley Square, that city hall where Mayor Deacons is, that municipal building, that one police plaza, all of that area is the African burial ground. Extended out to Chinatown, extended out to Little Italy, extended out to Greenwich Village, all of that was the original land given to Africans who struggled for freedom in this, this United States, in New York, when it was New Amsterdam. That land was given to our people in 1644, when they made a demand for freedom, having come here as indentured servants for the Dutch in 1626. African holy ground. And when you start to dig deep into the history, the latest African burial ground is probably laying on top of two other African burial grounds. And those three African burial grounds are laying on top of the most sacred and holy of the burial grounds in this hemisphere, and that's the Native American burial grounds that are right there in that same spot. And we stand with the Native Americans because most of us have Native American blood. And most of us have been in the struggle with the Native Americans. We stand with them. In fact, we speak for the 100 plus million Africans lost in our genocide and the Holocaust. And the 50 to 60 plus million Native Americans lost in the Holocaust visited upon us in these new worlds. We speak for them. People can talk about six to seven million, we can talk about 150 million. And we stand with 150 million. So you know, we couldn't have been successful in the legal process with the brilliant legal team, with the courage of Dr. J and the mentor and intellect that he stands on, symbolized by Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, we could not have been victorious if there wasn't a spiritual mission that we are involved in. We inherit this spiritual legacy, and it's something you've got to tap into. And other people would turn your heads away from it. That's why every talk show, every radio commentary, every TV program, cannot deal with the fact that African peoples raised, as we always had, that principal question of constitutional and human rights. And we won that fight. They still are down there in the muck and the mire. And they want to pull you down there too. I'm saying turn yourself away from them, turn your back on them, but keep your eye on them and move ahead to African glory and victory. So in the face of this enormous victory and fight, won for our children, in the name of our ancestors, and the almighty force of this universe, we have to acknowledge it. And in the African tradition, nothing happens 
unless there is a libation. Nothing happens unless you acknowledge the spiritualness that you stand with and the ancestors on whose shoulders you stand. And so as I am bringing my message to you, after this brief introduction, it's necessary for me to pour a libation. The reason for my being delayed in coming here was we had to run to the airport to greet the paramount chief of the Ashanti nation of Ashanti Agogo, Nana Akwaku Sapo, who has just arrived from Africa by way of London. And we greeted him and then accompanied him to Shechem or Shechem's place in Brooklyn. And after I greeted him and he brought the message of support from the continent, from Atunfo Opokuwari II, the king of kings of the Ashanti nation, from Nana Afawasa, the chief priestess of the Ashanti nation who we've known for 20 years, just like we've known the king for more than 20 years. From Bafo Ose Okuto, the chief linguist of the Ashanti nation, 87-year-old spiritual leader who carries the traditions of the Ashanti nation. All of these people sent their greetings and they let us know that they've been pouring libations every single day for us, knowing that we would be victorious and standing in the spirits of the ancestors. <laughs> but knowing you were here, I asked Namasafon for leave of absence from him to join you. And he said, continue the work that leave is granted. Now, Nana Sapon and Stool, my wife and myself, as queen mother and divisional chief among the Ashanti. So not only am I Dr. Leonard Jeffries Jr., PhD from Columbia University, master's from Columbia University, certificate of international affairs from the University of Lausanne, VA from Lafayette College, but I'm much more than that having gone to Africa 80 times, having lived there for a couple of years, having studied there and traveled throughout Africa. They recognized my love for the continent, my duty to the continent, and they made us part of the royalty and the traditional structure. So I have an African stool name, meaning being put on the stool means you're being brought into the chieftaincy. And my African stool name is Nana, which is the name for elder or leader, male and female. Kwakujua Ajiman the second. So if in the newspapers and on the radio and the TV you hear that this fellow, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, PhD from Columbia, has kind of chilled out, but there's a hellraiser over here named Nana Kwakujua Ajiman the second. You know, it's the same spiritual manifestation. And not only has Nana Sarpa instilled myself, he's instilled others. He instilled when we went on the pilgrimage last year to Africa, to Ghana, where we were in those forts and dungeons out of which our ancestors were pulled. All of these forts and dungeons built by these European nations. That's why it's clear for all of us who've been to Africa, that there's no singling out the Jews in reference to our enslavement, because one of the forts was built by the Portuguese, Elmina, taken over by the Dutch, another was built by the Swedes, taken over by the English, another was built by the Danes, taken over by the French, another was built by the Spanish, the Brandenburg Germans. You're talking about 40 forts and dungeons along that west coast of Africa called Ghana, linked to all of these European nations and then tied into their possessions in the Caribbean. We know who was involved in the enslavement. It has never been in our interest to single out a single group. We want to be able to put the blame on all of them that was involved, including the Catholic Church. But somebody pushed the Jewish button, the anti-Semitic button, and they thought that that would achieve their end of confusion and fear. It has not worked is a lesson for you to learn. But Brother Small was instilled in Ghana last year when we went on the pilgrimage. 
And I was installed in the Almina Fort courtyard, the dungeon, by the Aldina people, and made one of the Asapo chiefs last year. We have all of this on film. Brother Clemson Brown is getting it ready so that you can have the spiritual mission and pilgrimage that we were on last summer. And in fact, we're inviting you to come with us again this summer, because each year we will be doing this. And when you come back from that experience, just like Gary Bird went for the first time to West Africa doing uh, the uh, Panifest, and Gary has not been the same. And none of you will be the same once you touch that holy land of Africa and have that spiritual force <coughs> come into you. Others have been installed, and so we hope that Nanasapan will form a traditional council so that our responsibilities can be clear here in America as we bring forth the knowledge to you and we go back and forth to Africa. But just as Nanasapan said every day, they've been pouring libations on our behalf. I don't do anything important unless I pour libation, and I would ask permission of the elders. I hear Sister Franklin out there, and I ask Sister Franklin's permission to speak and pour libation. I didn't hear you, Sister Franklin. I didn't hear you, Sister Franklin. Madasi, thank you, Sister Franklin. Libation is a traditional ceremony which is very simple. It's acknowledgement of those people who went before and on whose shoulders you stand. And to hook you into their spiritualness, the libation is water poured to the ground. In the African tradition of communal, cooperative, and collective values, everyone participates with the leader in the libation. So as the water is poured to the ground, we would want you to acknowledge it. Acknowledge it in an African language. You can acknowledge in the language of the Africans of Ghana, the Akan people, in their language tree. And as the water is poured to the ground, you can acknowledge it by saying, Nya. Or you can acknowledge it in the language of the Yoruba culture and civilization. And as the water is poured to the ground in the Yoruba language, you can acknowledge it by saying, Ashe. Or you can acknowledge it in the language of the ancient Africans of the Nile as you hear us greet each other on the radio and when we greet each other on the street, you can acknowledge it in the metoneta, sometimes called hieroglyphs, and that acknowledgement can be in the term hotel, peace. Or any other African language that you have, you can acknowledge the pouring of the libation. But please don't sit there like Negroes from Brooklyn without anything to say. <laughs> In the name of the African ancestors who began the march of humankind in the womb of Mother Africa, we ask these ancestors to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. In the name of the African ancestors who began the march of humankind in the womb of Mother Africa and marched down the Nile, laying the foundations for human civilization and culture, we ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. In the name of these African ancestors who built their pyramids and their temples to their God concepts, to their principles, and to their moral values, who left us a legacy of architectural and monumental building unparalleled in the history of the world, we ask these ancestors who built the pyramids, who built the temples, to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. We ask these African ancestors who took this African culture and extended it throughout Africa, building the stone cities of Zimbabwe, building the empires of the Sudan, Ghana, Mali, and Sangai, building the Swahili city-states along the east coast of Africa, and in Christian Africa, asking King Lalibela and giving him the courage to build the 12 churches of Lalibela from the ground down, monuments to the world. We ask these Africans to spread this culture to the Dogo and to the Akan and to the Yoruba and to the Bantango and to the Nzulu. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us and give us a vision for the future. Amen. In the name of the Africans who opened up Africa, opened up the Nile Valley to other cultures and other peoples and they came in and nurtured themselves on the African greatness. First coming in early with the ancient Hebrews and they synthesized this culture and produced Judaism. Later coming in with the
Christians, and they synthesized this culture and produced Christianity. Coming in were also the Greeks, who took the African culture, synthesized it, and produced Greek civilization. And then later, the Prophet Muhammad, and with the Arabs, coming into the Nile Valley, they synthesized the culture and produced Islam. We ask these African ancestors, who as part of their legacy, laid the foundations for Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Greek civilization to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. Amen. We ask those African ancestors pulled out of Africa, taken to the hells of North America, South America, the Caribbean, maintaining the spirit of African humanity in their hearts and in their minds, and who left us this enormous legacy of struggle. We ask those Africans who resisted enslavement in the villages of Africa, who resisted enslavement in the shores of Africa, who resisted enslavement in those forts and dungeons, who resisted enslavement in the holes of those ships, who resisted enslavement when they arrived on these shores in the New World. We ask these Africans who ran into the highlands of Northeast Brazil and established for 100 years the first free republic in the Americas, the Republic of Palmares, and their last great leader, Zumbi, who spirit and sacrificed we ask these Africans who replicated the Brazilian experience and went into the highlands of Jamaica and became the Maroon Free Community. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of the Guyanas and Suriname and created Free Republic of the Suramaca and the Ajuka. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of Georgia and the swamps of Florida and moved with the Seminole Indians and resisted oppression. We ask these Africans who left us a legacy of struggle and resistance, the likes of which no one in the world has to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. We ask these Africans who created and laid for us a foundation of struggle and resistance that was passed on generation after generation, that was passed on to Harriet Tubman, who fell away out of enslavement and became a symbol of freedom for all of us. Similarly, Frederick Douglass and hundreds of thousands of others fought their way out of enslavement. We ask those Africans who went with Buckman Dessaline to create the greatest revolutionary experience in the history of the world, the Haitian Revolution, living as a legacy, the likes of which no one else has had. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. We ask these Africans who continue to struggle out of slavery in America, saving this nation, having fought in the Revolutionary War on both sides, the real freedom fighters being not the Jeffersons, not the Washingtons, not the Madisons, not the Moreau, not the Paul Revere, but Africans who fought on both sides of the revolutionary question for freedom. We ask those Africans who came out of the slave plantations and the free Africans who joined in this struggle and became the quarter million Africans who were the UST, USCT troops, United States color troops, and fought in the Civil War when white folks ran and fled, a half a million to a million white folks deserted the war and a half a million Africans replaced them and allowed for the destruction of enslavement and the freeing of four million of our ancestors and the saving of these United States into one nation. We ask these African ancestors who left us this legacy of one American nation to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. These African ancestors who continued after the war the Civil War, to build, and their demands produced the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, which gave us our citizenship rights, and ironically it was the 14th Amendment due process clause, which we stood on in that lawsuit in the courthouse, and the 15th Amendment, which gave us the right to vote. We ask these African ancestors who struggled for this freedom in their hearts, and left us this legacy of struggle to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. Amen. We ask those Africans who used their genius to help build America, who became the inventors that produced the light bulbs, who became the inventors that produced the third rail, who became the inventors that produced the refrigerator, who became the inventors that revolutionized agricultural science in America, who became the inventors that produced the gas mask, who became the inventors that produced the third world. We ask these African ancestors who made this enormous contribution to the science and technology of America before the waves and waves of millions of immigrants came from southern and eastern Europe, before the Italians, before the Jews, before the Poles, before the Russians received these songs. Africans have laid the foundation for the high technology of America. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us, and continue to give us the power to move forward. This tradition of contribution to self-development of Africans, this tradition of struggle was passed on to the Marcus Garvey, 
to Ida B. Wells, to the kings, and to your immediate great-grandparents. We ask these ancestors to strengthen us so that we can continue to do this in the name of our African future. Now, brothers and sisters, that we've cleared the air, we can get on to the presentation. So you can understand why people are upset that we're moving into this empowerment. Why they want to keep you ignorant. Because ignorance is powerlessness. Why they can't deal with Africa being the mothers of civilization and culture when all of the scientific information has shown to, that to be the case. Why they can't deal with the Nile Valley being the fountainhead of culture and civilization and the people in the Nile being Africans. If people want to enslave you, then they have to make you hate yourself. If people want to keep you disunited and underdeveloped, then they have to have you not seeing yourself at the center of your own development. And that's why we have to do what we're doing to raise these issues. So there are 10 major questions that come to fore when we deal with Africans and civilization. And these 10 areas produce a conflict with white domination and institutionalized white criminality. Number one, when we deal with African civilization, we have to raise the issue of the origin of humanity. Africa is the Holy Land and the Motherland. All of the scientific data is proving that. But you can't just accept that from Dr. Jeffries, even though we've written about it. You have to go to some of the major resources that are available. You have to start building a library for yourself. I know you're proud of all those earrings that you got. You're proud of those array of shoes that you got, the blouses that you got. You even got now some Kenti underwear. You're proud of all of that. But how many books do you have in your home for yourself? How many books do you have in your home for your mother? How many books do you have in your home for your children? How many books do you have in your home for that nephew of yours who's trying to do for self and you have to help him? One of the most important books that you have to tap into to deal with the African origin of humanity is the work by Dr. Shekhan Tadiop, Civilization and Barbarism. I'm very proud of this work because we were directly responsible for getting it published in English. We received a $10,000 grant from the Black United Fund. So if you can support the Black United Fund, make sure that you do. The major essay written about this book was my essay that was published in Van Sertima's journal of African Civilizations. And for six or seven years, it was the major thing in English about this book. And the people want to know, what have we published? Well, in the Van Sertima Journal, in 1982, we published an analysis of not only Sheikh Antetiop's masterwork, Civilization and Barbarism, but his whole tradition of works. Sheikh Antetiop, like Dr. Ben, like Dr. Clark, each of them, like Dr. Chancellor Williams, are schools of knowledge, and when you tap into their works, you tap into a series of works and lectures and papers that they've given. So when you talk about Shekhan Tadiyap in the essay that was written in 1982 in Ben Sertima's Journal of African Civilization and republished four times in Ben Sertima's publication, the last republication being in this book dedicated to Dr. Diop called Great African Thinkers, published in 1992, edited by Ivan Ben Sertima. Once again, the article and review of Diop's life and work was republished for the fourth time. They want to know what we published? This article was so powerful that it was published four times. But we didn't stop at publishing an article. We went and had the major work translated in English so it would be available to you. And this is one of those monumental classic text that you have to have in your library. It's going to take study groups for you to master this knowledge because this is the scientist speaking to other scientists, 
This is the scholar speaking to other scholars. This is the African genius challenging all of European scholarship and winning the fight. So when you have Dr. Diop's book, you know you're moving in the right direction. It's going to be difficult for you to read because when I went on sabbatical leave in 1983, I wanted to translate the book. But I didn't have time. Because in 1983, in the World Council of Churches in Geneva, the head of the World Council of all Protestant churches was a black man called Philip Potter, who happened to have grown up with my partner, Edward Scobie, in the little island of Dominica. And when I challenged Philip Potter, the head of the World Council of Churches, on what they are doing for the Africans in South Africa, Zania, and in Namibia in terms of struggle, and I did not think that the churches were doing enough, then this leader of the World Council of Churches, this black man, said that I'm going to appoint a task force and you're going to be the head of the task force to make the world body of churches more responsive to the struggle in South Africa. So I was trying to do two monumental things. Head a task force dealing with South Africa for the world body of churches and also translate this work. So that didn't give me much time for anything else but seriousness. But the struggle in South Africa intensified. They were trying to destroy the South African Council of Churches. They were trying to suppress the African liberation movements. They had what they called total war, total strategy. And so the effort in South Africa became premier, and I had to concentrate on that. This involved an everyday activity. Every day I had to go to the World Council of Churches and take the teletypes and the wire messages off and read them and analyze them and then prepare documentation to go out to the world body of churches. This was a monumental task for me to fulfill. And while we did all of this, one of the important things for, for us was to publish some of the results of that work. So as a result, we edited a book called South Africa in Crisis, 1983. The major article in here is a 55-page article that I wrote which deals with and is entitled the struggle in South Africa, a universal moral crisis. That was a message to the world body of churches that if they say they stand in the light of the Lord, then they better start helping out the people in South Africa. Because there's nobody doing the work of the Lord more than those who are struggling against the destruction of fascism, neo-fascism, which was the apartheid system. So we're going to make sure that this particular volume is in your hands. We have it in what we call the African Power Pack, available for you to purchase, and that will help us with the legal funds. They want to know what Dr. Jeffries produced. Well, in 1982, he produced the Diop article, which led eventually to the publication of the Diop book. In 1983, he went on sabbatical leave with the World Council of Churches, and he not only motivated the world body of churches to help that struggle in South Africa, but he was able to produce a volume edited by him for the world body of churches to be conscious of what they have to do in South Africa. When he came back in 1983 on the fall, he led Coretta Scott King to Zimbabwe. And then he became involved with Robert Mugabe, the Prime Minister of Zimbabwe and the leadership there, and trying to build a bridge between black America and Zimbabwe because they had just become independent. But in 1984, we were moving into another dimension of African consciousness. In 1979, an important event happened at City College. One of our student leaders, Mike Edwards, had challenged white folks teaching in City College in 1979 that Africa contributed nothing to world civilization and culture. And this brother took the works of Dr. Ben, the black man of the Nile, took the works of Dr. Diop, such as the African origin of civilization, took the works of Dr. Chancellor William, such as the destruction of black civilization, took the work of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Negro History Week and the Association of Study of um, Negro Life and History, the miseducation of the Negro. He took these books and went into the classroom and challenged the students to search for the truth. The professor got upset. Realizing how serious this brother was, the professor dismissed the class and went to get the security. When he came back with the security, and luckily the security was a black man who had his head on right. And then Mike Edwards was in there teaching with the works of Dr. Ben, the works of Dr. Diop, the works of Dr. Clark, the works of Dr. Chancellor William, the works of John Jackson. 
And when the professor asked the security to get rid of this young man in the class, the security smartly replied to the professor, well, professor, didn't you say you dismissed the class? And the professor said, yes. Well, then the guard said, well, this is something else that's happening here now. <laughs> so Mike Edwards taught the class. And as a result, there was a major issue that involved academic freedom and the right of Africans to know their truth. So I immediately called up the president, Robert E. Marshak, the only Jewish president of City College. And I said, I interpose myself in the Black Studies Department between you and Mike Edwards. Do not think that you can touch a hair on his head without being accountable to us. And the struggle was engaged. It was a struggle of white folks' academic freedom and the struggle of a greater freedom of Africans to know their history. And they had hearings. And the hearings became so controversial that hundreds of people came up from the Harlem community, Dr. Ben, Queen Mother Moore, Dr. Clark. They could not find large enough space to hold the hearings. So they knew they had struggle on their hands. So the Jewish president, Robert E. Marshak, sat down with me in his office and said, Len, I think we can work this thing out. I said, okay, Bob, what is your suggestion? <laughs> and President Robert E. Marshak said, we Jews had this problem years ago. I said, yes, Bob, tell me more. <laughs> well, at the University of Chicago, there was a professor who said that um, there was not a Holocaust. And so they solved that problem by having a great conference on the Holocaust and the destruction of European Jews in Europe. So his suggestion was that, Len, we can have a conference on this question of the role of Africans in early civilization. I said, tell me more, Bob. Well, he said, I'd be willing to put up some money. We could allocate at least $10,000. I said, good, Bob. I'll put up $3,000 from our budget, our lecture budget. And then we got the dean to put up $3,000. So with the $16,000, we were prepared to organize a conference on early civilization. This conference took place, the planning of it, for eight months in my office with all of the chairmen of the social science department. I told them, you can get anybody you want. Bring in all of your great scholars. All we want you to do is bring in Dr. Sh